in a weird way, I still don't have the ambition to be a curator, but I do feel like it's something I just have an innate, for whatever reason, I think a mm-hmm. talent for that. For me, it's just an immediate, innate thing. And I think it's probably based on, I think comic books had a lot to do with it. Stan Lee, Stan Lee, the great mm-hmm. editor at Marvel Comics there, uh, the co- the cover was the most important part. Like that's like 90% of the sales was mm-hmm. based on the cover. And I stared at those comics for years. Like that's what I would do on a Saturday afternoon. In a weird way, I was trained by like these, you know, creative directors from like OPG and Tops, if you know what I mean. And like comic mm-hmm. companies. Mm-hmm. Hello everyone, I'm here today with Adrian Pocobelli from the Artist Journal. Hello Adrian, how are you doing? I'm doing fabulous. Uh, it's great to uh, meet you, Kalo, uh, over the airwaves here. I mean, I've seen a ton of your, you know, work uh, over the last, it's probably been like a year and a half since around, like, I think you started before I did, didn't you? Like, uh, so yeah, no, it's great to meet you. I'm happy. Yeah, no, I'm a big fan of your show. And, and actually, I think I might have started writing before, but your show has been going for way longer than my podcast because I started my podcast like five months ago. Right. And I think right. the Artist Journal has been around for over a year, right? Yeah, a year and a half. Although I think you're writing. I was thinking of your newsletter, right? And how long has your newsletter been yeah. going? So that started in May 2021. So wow. getting close to three years. Yeah. Yeah. Been there you while. go. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. So awesome. I mean, that's impressive in this space, keeping something going for that long, especially writing. Writing's not easy to uh, stick with. It's a, it's a more challenging medium, uh, I find, than video. Yeah. I think, yeah, you're right. I think, so I, one of my main goals is to, you know, the discipline. Even if um, if I don't have the the if I don't I don't feel like writing, I try to you know write something, even if it's short. Um, and a newsletter is a very flexible medium, right? Because when you think about a podcast, you need to have a guest, you need to plan what are you going to talk about. Like in your case, right, with the artist journal, you prepare the artwork in advance, and you take a look at them previously. But the newsletter is a very flexible medium, right? You can write short, uh, short form, long form. You can do kind of a review of the latest news. Um, it's it's very very flexible. But yeah, it's not it's not easy, right? To keep it up for for so long. And um, I think that the goal is to have a um, you know a community that you you kind of already established that you will write once a week or twice a week and, and that keeps keeps you going right it's like a in a way like like a like a job right in in, in some sense but yeah i'm excited i actually um, i am you know i'm very happy with the uh, how long i've been able to keep it keep it going um and congrats on your on your show the artist journal let, let me tell you adrian you have one of the best introductions that i've seen in the whole in the whole podcasting space, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. It's it's amazing. <laughs> I, I really like the energy you bring to to your show. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know what's funny about that? It's uh, it's all the AM radio. I I was used to for about twenty years. I listened to a ton of uh, AM radio and coast to coast AM. Uh-huh. So it's like it's yeah, Art Bell. Uh, a lot of the big radio hosts there out of the U.S. really. Yeah, so they always start with a lot of energy. So that's where I get that from. Yeah, so thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. I mean, I think that's the the right way to do it. But it's it's not it's not easy for everyone, right, to bring that kind of energy. Mm. Is that something that you learned during your uh, radio time, like, or were you like that from the from the first the first time you did radio? No. So when I started the show like the artist journal show a year and a half ago it yeah like it's something that kind of builds up because you're almost too shy you're going in front of the camera for the first time and it almost seems like a little boastful and preposterous 
to start shouting into the microphone and being like, all right, everybody, here we go. <laughs> um, but what, so it, what's funny is, is, you know, by, by maybe episode 40 and then the audience eggs you on and says, oh, that's great. I love it. So you kind of, it becomes, you normalize it over time. Mm. Now I can do it. And it's not like, uh, in a sense, you're not like overly, uh, it's, you're not overly self-conscious about it because I simply do it. I've done it 300 times or 250 times. Right. Mm. So it's, it's kind of normalized it. So it's, it kind of removes an inherent reluctance and almost a bit of shyness that you initially have when you start. And, uh, I always kind of wanted to go there, but it's really, uh, yeah, it's, it's something you have to normalize because it's not, in a sense, it's not a normal kind of, you don't walk into a room. I mean, some people do actually walk into rooms and they start shouting and it's actually really fun. Those people are great. I'm not yeah. really one of those people generally, but on the radio. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I love the energy. Like, I'm just really trying to recapture uh, the radio shows that I grew up with, really, <laughs> ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's about, you know, getting the feedback from, from your audience, and then you start to, to understand, like, what are the things they are enjoying, right? And, mm. and of course, you need to, you need to, to like it, too, right? And, and, and in a way keep it up for so long so it's something you need to you need to feel confident about and but you're right it's uh it's tricky especially for introverts um to kind of go on camera right or go go uh, mm -hmm. online record their audio even their audio their yep. voice alone is hard for for many artists i i am I'm, I'm a friend of many artists that they don't do x spaces right they don't go on podcasts and they are amazing, but it's a, it's kind of um, you know, it's an advantage if you if you are able to, especially for artists, right? If you are willing to put yourself out there, it could be challenging early on, but if you if you kind of enjoy it, it's it's amazing. And I was actually going to ask you about that, like as an artist and now as a content creator, how much does you know having that ability to record yourself, be on camera, meet other people. How much has that helped you to your, you know, your development as, a, as an artist as a, and as a content creator in general? I, it is a very interesting question. I, it has helped me in the sense, like the, I guess the underlying motivation for starting a show like this, I mean, it is an artist journal, right? where I talk about my thoughts about stuff and it's kind of like a documentation. I mean, ultimately, I mean, part of the motivation behind it was I felt like I was going to die in obscurity if I didn't start doing something like this. And I had talked to a friend of mine who's a musician here in Berlin, also from Canada, a few years older than me, brilliant musician. And we were talking, you know, because we always kind of talk, how are we going to, you know, improve our situation here? So we always enjoy talking to each other on that as artists, you know, and, you know, one of the conversations we had was, well, imagine if you did a YouTube show every day for a year, like, do you think you would be doing better in your art? And it was kind of like the, it was kind of a unambiguous, yes, I think I would be doing better. And, but I never did anything mm -hmm. about it. Cause of course, as you rightly point out, it's it's not easy. I think the important thing for artists to understand who are shy or who don't like to speak is it's not easy for anyone. It wasn't easy for me. I'm sure it wasn't easy for you. And nobody likes the sound of their voice the first time they hear it. Mm -hmm. After a while, you just get used to it. And then you just accept that it's not as bad as you think it is. Right. And same with video. I mean, video is like that times 10. But ultimately, uh, it so it's helped enormously in terms of just exposure. I mean, ultimately, I mean, it's helped me get my art out there, get more feedback and just awareness of my art. Well, but it's kind of funny though, it's taken a life of its own. In a sense, you might say the original motivation was uh, A, to share my thoughts, because I like, I have a bunch of opinions on things. So I thought that was a fun thing to do. It's an idea that's been in my head for years. Uh, but the other motivation was to, okay, maybe this will help draw attention to my art. I mean, it's half the battle as an artist is getting attention. And so what's interesting about the show is it's kind of taken a life of its own, in a sense. Like, it's kind of almost 
you know, it's almost, it has taken away time from the art making and I'm trying to fix that now. I've gone to three days a week rather than four uh, to try and fix that because, uh, you know, it's sort of like a side project that's kind of overwhelmed everything. Uh, so yeah, so it's helped in, in a sense, it's hurt it to a certain degree, but ultimately making sales, uh, I do not take it for granted. And, uh, because I have, you know, I'm 44 years old turning 45, you know, this week, actually on Thursday. And mm -hmm. I know what it's like to go 10 years without making a sale and nobody taking you seriously as an artist and whatever, you know, so I don't take it at mm -hmm. every single sale. Uh, I am grateful for, and like, I have many friends in the regular contemporary art scene here in Berlin. And I mean, they don't talk about making sales. So, uh, so ultimately it has been helpful doing the show because it has helped make sales. And th there is a legitimacy, at least a personal legitimacy. And, you know, ultimately, as I say, time is the ultimate judge on all this stuff. You know, I was just seeing some tweets. Mm -hmm you know, about how Mondrian didn't make a sale or barely made a sale and this sort of thing. Uh, you know, so ultimately time is the judge and people can make big sales and then nobody cares about their work a hundred years later. But it is encouraging. Yeah. And that might sound like a small yeah. thing, but it's actually quite large for an artist. As there, I was reading in that tweet, you know, Mondrian was thinking about being an olive picker and just thinking like nobody cares. I mean, half the battle, again, yeah. as an artist is being taken yeah. seriously. People don't take you seriously. Like especially if you have no success, which is where everybody starts, right? So yeah. it's been helpful. Yeah, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. And in, I mean, besides helping you as an artist, right, to bring more exposure to, to your art, you are also helping other artists, right? Because you are basically giving reviews and sharing other people's art. So that's, that's amazing. So you're building a very, very interesting community of people that like to go deep into the meaning behind the art and at the same time bringing attention to your craft, right? And building a community that you're right. For some people it might look, um, same with my podcast, like it's a small community. But if you think about the space, the digital art space, it's not a huge space. It's impossible to have million views these days. And it's a, it's a great percentage of digital art lovers when you think about their numbers. So it's uh, amazing, Adrian. I, I'm really, really happy for, for your success. And I, I wish more, more artists will jump on board, right? And jump on, on this kind of uh, digital art reviews and, and discussing and, and, you know, having conversations about uh, different contemporary art or different blockchain art or digital art. So it's very, very interesting. And you mentioned you, you live in, in Berlin. Um, and I, I think you are originally from Canada. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I come from a small city in the mid, in the Midwest, in the middle of Canada. It's almost right in the middle of Canada, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And I stayed there until mm -hmm. I was 25 uh, and going, went to university for eight years. So went did all my, you know, undergrad, went, did a master's in English there. And then I moved to Montreal for eight years. And didn't really get too much success. I was kind of a poor English teacher making my art on the side. And again, nobody taking me seriously as an artist at all. And then I moved to Toronto for four years and uh, hoping I'd do better. And I did a little bit better. I actually ended up, you know, it was the humblest of beginnings in a sense. Like it was like, uh, mm -hmm. he actually has a, I just saw his, this guy, this gallerist uh, on uh, Instagram. I think it's like the super something gallery and he would have this thing where you could basically apply to be in and pay 30 bucks to put your work on the wall and i had had so little exposure or shows i was just like let's do it because at least someone will see <laughs> and maybe there's a tiny hope and actually i sold a painting a little lego painting mm -hmm. and that was actually my first you know real kind of any kind of validity from a market point of view uh, so that was good. And, but also Toronto was just really tough. Uh, it's, you know, it's a tough city for, I would say for the arts, cause there's not a huge, there's not a huge, there's not a huge amount of success I'd say in the, and I'm talking about the contemporary art world and it's a very, yes. very challenging just in general, there's not much success. 
So I moved yeah. to, I was traveling to these art shows when I was living in Toronto, just as an excuse to go to LA. I went to the LA Art Fair, then I went to the Armory Show in New York. I went to Art Basel, Miami Beach, uh, 2012. Mm-hmm. You know, check them out. And I went to Berlin on uh, just to go to, I think it was called ABC, Art Berlin Contemporary. And I had one of these kind of classic, you know, the, ma- I was almost going to say cliche, but magical, you know, Berlin vacations where you show up for the first time. And like within 36 hours, I was in Bergein, like the main club there in the, on, the, on the dance floor and just going, I think I want to move here. Uh, this is amazing. I, and what's ironic is I've, I haven't really found myself on the dance floor since moving and everything mm-hmm. at, at Bergein, which is kind of funny. But uh, so anyway, so yeah, a year later, almost which, to the which day. Which year was it? Uh, so which year was it again? Uh, 2015, I went to the art fair in September 10th or something. And then September 10th, 2016 was when I landed uh, to move. Like, so it took me a year. Mm. My family thought I was crazy. My friends thought I was nuts. And it was one of those things uh, that I just, uh, I even did a second trip, the make sure trip, you know, to make sure I knew what I was doing. And I remember as I was landing and for the make sure trip that I was making the right decision, as the plane was landing, I'm like, I'm totally moving. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, so, so anyways, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I've been yeah, here for no, seven years now. Yeah, seven and a half. Yeah, I mean, that, in a way, I think that also nurtures your, you know, your career, right? The, the All these um, experiences, right? Because I, I also, totally. I, I moved a lot as well. I've moved uh, to multiple countries. So. I I am originally from Venezuela and and I left when I was young with my family. We moved to Mexico. We moved uh, because my my dad's job, and I lived in Mexico for six years. Um, and I that's where I went to college. And after college, I moved to Florida, and and I spent four years in Florida working there as a engineer. And after that, I moved to Europe and and mm-hmm. lived in in. In Germany as well, in Munich. Uh, that's where I was working as a product manager. But I mean, my my point is that I understand the the complexities of moving. It's a it's a big challenge, but you learn you learned a lot. And and if you manage to you know pass the first year, usually maybe first six months, the first year, then it's amazing because the, you settle down in a in a new city, right? You you learn so many from. The new culture you're in, and I, I'm, I'm not really an artist, right? But I can imagine how an artist like yourself can take all those experiences, right? And, and that's reflected um, in your work or in your, in your ideas, right? Or as you said, like in your case, starting a show. Um, so very exciting, Berlin. Um, so yeah, it makes sense, right? Because Berlin has a vibrant seen right in in terms of mm-hmm. art there are many galleries there are many shows even for digital art i know expanded that art from anika Meyer is there um and bright moments have done shows there in berlin um and you think that's important adrian now that you are settled down in in berlin and and you compare it to your time in canada do you think as an artist it pays to you know move to a city with more opportunities and and you have a, a very interesting you know experience because you are in the digital in the digital art space right so do you think that these days today if you were Amer- starting again you were twenty years old um, will you consider moving to a city like Berlin L A or will you try to you know give it a shot all digitally uh, from Canada from Canada again what are your thoughts? Yeah, very, very interesting question. Um, that's a tough one. I, I think just the, like, I'm kind of a culture person at the end of the day. Like, I like culture. So I do tend to gravitate towards bigger cities. And ultimately, Europe did seem to be, I don't want to use the word so- more sophisticated, but slightly more, put it this way, in Europe, per, say in Germany or Italy, there's a there's a bigger premium than let's say in Toronto in my experience only in my experience mm-hmm. other people may feel differently but there's a bigger premium put on 
really having a, a knowledge about culture and an understanding mm -hmm. about the tradition, however you want to define that. And it doesn't mean it's not important in Canada, but like say in Saskatoon where I grew up, like it's not particularly important because a lot of people aren't familiar with it. It's not as part of the cultural, you know, nexus, so to speak, whereas in Europe, yeah. because it's kind of a small geography, Europe, and there's so much that's happened that Europe itself, mm -hmm. even in the smaller cities like you're in, there's still like a pretty vibrant uh, cultural understanding and you don't even need to be an artist. Yeah right? Like it, it's yeah. a different level of cultural awareness. And so mm -hmm. I would do it still at age 20. I love Europe. I think Europe is a gem of a place. It's, you know, fairly safe mm. and fairly and a lot of great options out there as far as traveling for cheap, uh, great weather. If you, you know, are willing to move around a bit and plan a little bit, the winter is tricky in Germany, but Still go to Sicily, go to the Canary mm -hmm. Islands. And you can go to, you know, Egypt or somewhere else, you know, like you don't need to, or Turkey, yeah. right? You don't need to stay in Europe yeah. and still have a reasonably priced vacation. So all to say, uh, Europe, yeah, I would still do it. And yeah, it's not like I'm thinking, oh, I'm digital now. I, I do think, like, to your point, like it is, as an artist who had never lived in what I'd call a major art city, it did feel good. It felt like I was kind of making a step forward by moving to Berlin, having never lived in mm -hmm. what I'd call like uh, one of the main official art capitals. But it is one of the art capitals, yeah. you could argue, Berlin. Uh, and so that felt good because I felt like, okay, uh, I'm still giving myself a shot here. I, you know, I, I'm not sabotaging myself by staying in a smaller city that maybe uh, the art world you know, maybe doesn't care about. But to your point, in a digital world, it is becoming less relevant to me in the sense that, mm. hey, I thought about, you know, I still think to myself, maybe I should move to Rome at some point. And it's it's an mm. art capital, but not in the same way, you might say, uh, more in a classic sort of way, backward looking, wow. or like looking through time sort of way. Um, but I don't feel like that's as big of an issue anymore because of digital. So to your point. so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe, or even go to a nice like town in Spain or something. You know, go to San Sebastian mm -hmm. there and live. I I could do that. The weather's probably fabulous, right? So yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so I think yeah, that makes sense. You you will still move, but you probably will have a a, a bigger range, more range to of cities to select. You you don't necessarily need to move to. One of those art capitals, right? Like Berlin, Paris, um, exactly. LA, New York. You have, the range is much more. Like there are many more options now, thanks to the digital, the digital space. But it still pays off to go to a place with a decent amount of uh, art, art culture and movement. But yeah, to your point about Europe, I'm also you know I lived in in US. I I have been living in in Europe now for eight years. Yeah, I really, I really enjoy um, the flexibility, right? The, it's so easy to travel. Um, the, the culture, like, it's, it's, it's like you take a plane one, two hours, and you are in a, in another country with everything has changed, right? In a way, and, and so many things to see. Um, and in terms of art, but also in, 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 in other aspects. Um, and yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a. It's a great point what you bring uh, about the digital being being important now, but it's not like it changes drastically everything, right? And um, I think one example is with your, you, I think you have in a studio, right? You work in the studio, you mentioned the studio, um, ha having a physical uh, a space to work on. So being in the digital art space doesn't mean everything is uh, you know your tools. Everything is digital, right? You 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 work a lot with physical uh, paintings, right? Can you tell us a bit about that, Adrian? And and how did you find like a space to work in your craft? How important is to have a studio um, for yourself, and also what you what you know from other artists? How 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 is that really really important to have a space designed to create? 
Yeah, so I was always, I, I never had my own uh, studio space that I rented uh, that was separate, that I'd travel to. I would work out of my apartment generally. Uh, and, but the place where I would work, I would put the money that I'd put, you know, because, you know, the whole dream of having like a 300 euro per month studio in Berlin is kind of dead. Uh, now it's probably like five or 600 yeah. euros. That's another story. That starts to compete with your rent out here. So where I go is to a place called Bethanian. If I want to make physical work, they have massive screen printing studio. The money that I could spend in rent, I would much rather basically use that as my studio uh, when I'm making physical work. So these days, I haven't actually made a ton of physical work, I'd say, in the last two to three years. I, I made some in my last apartment, but uh, I haven't made a ton of physical work. Uh, I guess it was probably a couple of years ago, a year and a half since the last time I went to Bethanian. Uh, I'm so, I mean, digital is so cheap and in a weird way, it's so much easier to sell that, yeah. you know, I don't want to say the finance is the only, and I think there, it's very important to make physical work just as an artist. I think it's healthy. I think it actually makes you a better artist to make both physical and to go back and forth between digital and physical and make physical work and see how that informs digital and as well digital work and making it physical. I think it gives you a deeper understanding of the, what I'd call the, one of the main conversations in contemporary art, which I, is mm -hmm. traveling through the mediums, which I think, you know, you see in Andy mm -hmm. Warhol's late work with the Goethe, you know, doing the graphite pencil, taking a photograph, you know, tracing, taking a photograph of that, blowing it up, screen printing it with rainbow ink, right? And so you're using all these different mediums together, using magnification. Uh, so I think it's very powerful to go back and forth. Like how would you, for example, you know, if you have a pixel artwork that's 256 by 256 uh, pixels, like how are you going to turn that into a work? And what are you going to use? Screen printing? I mean, there's a whole bunch of you could... Theoretically, you could use a block. Mm. I just saw that at the Digital Art Museum here yeah. uh, on the weekend. So, uh, yeah, so all to say, I think it's important, but I don't, I'm, I'm not sold that it's worth it, in a sense. Like, I'm very mm. choosy about how yeah. I spend that money in the sense that I'd rather spend it at Bethanian and have world-class, you know, screen printing and printer supplies and spend that on the supplies that, they, that they'll yeah. sell to me there than to spend it on an empty space and then... I'd rather almost just try and find, put a blanket down in the apartment and, you know, save money. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 No, yeah. that, that makes sense. And, and, and to your point about the, the materials, right? The, the, um, how you produce physical work, even if you are a digital artist, it's, it's very common, right? These days to, to see artists creating print shops, right? Or hmm. creating in the case of generative art, uh, plotters, plotter work. And, you know, I've been spending some time researching because I, 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 I wanted to buy a couple of prints. And, you know, it's a, it's a big deal, like the, the material they use, uh, what kind of paper they're using, the size, um, and it affects the work, how the work mm. looks like. And, and then the Absolutely. pricing changes drastically depending on the materials they are, they are using. Um, and, and you're right that artists need to go through that process, right? And, and, you know, experiment and, and see, okay, maybe this paper is, is, looks good when I buy it, but how will the final piece look on that, on, the, on this particular paper, right? Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's a, a great point, um, Adrian. And what about the, um, your curation? And, and this is a, a question I had for you because, you know, I've seen many, many artists that have a lot of success as curators, and I think you are, in a way, um, a curator, right? With your show, with the Artist Journal, that's, uh, that's uh, basically you're curating um, different kind of works, different kind of artists. And how do you find inspiration? Like, because there are tons of artwork, right? And, and there are tons of digital artworks that are different mediums, that are different platforms, marketplaces. But you have a very kind of, a, 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 you know, it's very diverse what you show, but there needs to be something that 
let's say if an artist would like to be on your show or how do you select the works that you are actually going to talk about? Is it because you feel like there is a lot of history and, you know, substance behind them or you do a research on the artist and how do you discover these pieces? What's, how does that look like? It's a very interesting question. And I've never, you know, it's weird because I've never, and I, in a weird way, I still don't have the ambition to be a curator, but I do feel like it's something I just have an innate, for whatever reason, I think a mm-hmm. talent for that or whatever you want to call it, ability, or I have my, w- within the context of what I like. So people don't have to like what I curate, but, you know, within my own world, uh, for me, it's just an immediate innate thing. And I think it's probably based on, I think comic books had a lot to do with it. Stan Lee, Stan Lee, the great editor at Marvel Comics there, uh, the, co- the cover was the most important part. Like that's like 90% of the sales was mm-hmm. based on the cover. And I stared at those comics for years. Like that's what I would do on a Saturday afternoon. Same with trading cards. So in a weird way, mm-hmm. even stamps, in a weird way, I was trained, especially with trading cards and comics, in a weird way, I was trained by like these you know, creative directors from like OPC and Tops, if you know what I mean, and like comic mm-hmm. companies. And so yeah. having spent like years, most of my youth on the weekends, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not really, uh, obsessing mm-hmm. over these owning, you know, as a kind of collector of these things and just staring at them, that I've done so much of my life with that, and as well as studying the history of art and the ambitions of being an artist, which means you have to understand the tradition. Uh, so you put it all together, and for me, it's just a very easy thing to do, like in terms of knowing what I like, right? And for me, yeah. so I can yeah. just look at a work and within a millisecond, generally, not always. Sometimes you have to look two or three times, yeah. and it can take a few minutes sometimes, and even a few weeks or months. You know, like Hasdrubal Waffle, mm-hmm. I didn't understand. And then now I understand it. So I get it right away. And I love it. One of my favorites. But for a while, I didn't get it. Like, I didn't get what. The, so, yeah. you know, uh, but generally speaking, it's a very easy process for me where I just kind of have an innate. It's almost reptilian brain. I just kind of know, quote unquote, what works for me and in a sense what I can live with. And I try yeah. and be as gener- generous as possible. Uh, and, uh, so I try, but I also need to make sure that I can live with showing that. And it's not in a sense in, in my own kind of private aesthetic, you know, universe that I'm not sort of undermining myself by just showing Mm. anything. I do try and keep a kind of consistent, uh, for lack of better term, curatorial style. Yeah. 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 No, that, that makes sense. And I think it shows, and that's what makes your, your show unique, right? That, you follow kind of your own taste. And, and if you look at different episodes, you understand that you know what you are getting, right? What kind of, in, not like aesthetically, but the kind of quality or the vision, let's say the cur- curatorial vision that it's behind it. And you mentioned the, the collectibles, the physical collectibles. I, I also spent time, my youth with... Uh, Magic the Gathering, the trading yeah, card sure. game. I used to play a lot. Yeah. And I was more into the gaming part, playing games, um, more than the collecting aspect. But I did have you know, a lot of, of cards, and and I still have them. And and when you mentioned, I, I remember those times. And in a way, um, so, I mean, there are two things that come to mind. Um, so the first one is, do you think people that love collecting physical physical stuff like comics and, and in this case magic magic the gathering stamps do you think they are a natural fit for digital art or digital collectibles or do you think there is something about the physical the physical aspect that some people really need what, what are your thoughts there if you if you showed nfts to your friends that you used to collect with and talk about comics and stamps, do you think they will love NFTs or not necessarily? It depends how, I would argue it depends how sophisticated, you know, again, in my own private universe, how sophisticated their image understanding is in a sense, because it's all images at the end of the day, like Mm. they have kind of a radically 
unsnobby view of images of what can be art. So, you know, I can look at literally, you know, torn paper on the side of a street uh, wall on a street and be like, you know, need to take a picture of that and go, oh, that'd make a great surface mm -hmm. for an uh, art piece. Um, mm -hmm. But so I think it's related in, like, I think they could. That being said, I will say this, like, say the art on Tezos, it does take time. Like, when I started the show, I felt uncomfortable showing pixel art, but I just said, screw it. Uh, I'm going to show pixel art because, <laughs> first of all, I need some content for this show. And I got, you know, people have to, there's also feeding the beast. Like, now I have a ton of content to, that I'm kind of aware of. Uh, and now I understand glitch mm -hmm. more and pixel art more. And yeah. But there, at the start, I was kind of a bit of a, snob, you know, slightly snobby, you might say, towards digital painting. Uh, certain things. Mm -hmm. And it was during the show that I learned that I developed an appreciation for AI, uh, again, mm -hmm. pixel art. And now I think pixel art is incredibly important. Yep. So I guess the importance of an open mm -hmm. mind to, and so those, to, your, to answer your question on say, like if people you knew who liked comics back then, would they appreciate it? I think so, but they might need a couple of months mm -hmm. or a few months uh, or, you know, watch the yep. show, let's say for a few weeks. Because uh, sometimes people will yeah. watch the show even, and they don't really get it. They they don't see what the revolution is yeah. if they're from outside the scene. Uh, it's a language, right? And and it's like uh, yeah. if you don't speak the language, it's hard, right, to understand and to be able to yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, no, I I totally get it. Actually, it's something that I also you know struggle with a bit because the space is so deep that once you develop an audience. Um, you have kind of a, an advanced language, right? You are not explaining the, the basic concepts anymore. You go straight to, you know, the, the hardcore, right? Hardcore stuff, like, and, and we use a lot of jargon. So that makes it very hard for newcomers, right? To, to read my newsletter out of the gates. The, probably they won't get 60% of the content. And then when I try to be very, you know, simple and, and explain the fundamentals more, then it could be boring. It gets boring for the people that are, you know, very, very used to the space that are, let's say, advanced and experts, collectors. So it's tricky. I think that's totally. why it's challenging. It's challenging for creators, uh, for content creators uh, to produce, um, you know, content in the space. And if you, if you kind of st are like, very educational, right? And you start to, you know, explain everything. At some point, the, your listeners or your, your audience kind of matures and they are looking for something more advanced and then they tune to your show or tune to more sophisticated uh, conversations and, and content. So it's tricky, it's tricky, but but yeah, I do see, I do see that there are some simili similarities, but it, there is a learning curve, right? First, the technology, and then, you know, more in terms of art, like the different styles, why pixel art is interesting, why glitch art is interesting. And, and, and in a sense, it takes, it takes time. And Adrian, do you think that, I mean, you started the show one year and a half ago. What, what are, what are your, your feelings about the space today compared to back then? Uh, of course, you, you have grown your audience, right? You now have followers that are, you know, very much engaged with your content. That's fantastic. But but in terms of what they are, you know, what they want to see, what they want to hear, what what interest do, do, do they have? Do you see some trends there, some mm -hmm. recurrent trends from, from your listeners? That is a very interesting question. I mean, it has changed a lot. And because, like, you know, I've done it, without too many breaks, breaks three or four weeks here and there for vacations. I think I did that two or three times, maybe three weeks. I, uh, you know, a lot has changed interestingly in the sense that like, I remember when I started, basically I would start with just the notifications on object, right? And I'd just pick out my favorite things from the last day or so on object. And then that would be the show, maybe 10 works. I kind of want to go back to that almost like that would be wonderful. Uh, but 
Uh, but back then, say, if you're an artist on Tezos, it was a big deal to shift over to ETH, right? Or to even go to different chains. Like, it was kind of like, should you do this? Like, there was kind of a bit more tribalism. Hmm. And I feel yeah. that that tribalism from the artist's perspective has diminished. And I think that's very healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, so now mm -hmm. I see more of a multi-chain sort of philosophy or approach uh, where it's people aren't as, for you know, tribalistic. I was going to say religious about their blockchain that they yeah. use. Uh, they realize mm -hmm. now that there are other collectors on different chains and that some, you know, again, then there's a lot of, I probably the most pushback I've gotten on the show is on, you know, Hey, you can went work on Solana, you know, like there's great collectors there. Uh, and that's the most pushback I get from the people who are like, you know, decentralization is important, Adrian, and, you know, mm -hmm. don't take it so lightly. And so <laughs> it, it still exists, yeah. but I, I'm kind of always like an artist first. And if I thought Solana was going to take over, maybe I'd think differently. And I'm not, as I told people, and it kind of ended, I think it helped end the debate, or at least put a close to the conversation was, you know, it's not like I'm saying people should exclusively put their work on Solana. And I, you know, I don't think that about any chain, you know, right now, again, mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, I, Bitcoin's super exciting, you know, just in terms of what it represents yeah. as, you know, kind of, it's almost like making work out of gold, you know, and so these uh, inscriptions, yeah. you know, so ordinals, right? So, uh, yeah. you know, that's one thing that I think has changed. Uh, as far as where it's going, that, that's a really interesting question. I'm, I think it's kind of a weird kind of free-for-all right now, to be honest. I'm, I'm not sure I see any really big trends, other than I see a remarkable amount of analog, mm -hmm. what I call analog video glitch. Uh, and a surprisingly strong market mm -hmm. for it, uh, also on Solana, interestingly. So that is interesting to me. Uh, Glitch, in a weird way, is, you know, it's, in a sense, it's just starting to be accepted, you could say, on an institutional level. But in the mm -hmm. Web3 yep. digital art space, I feel like it's more of like a core pillar, yep. one of the, you know, yep. seven or eight pillars, you might say. Um, so... I don't, yeah, it's it's an interesting question as far as trends and where things are going. I kind of feel like it's an experimental stage, uh, you know, uh, I think people are just, you know, it's kind of like the market at work. People are just trying to sell work. And so we're seeing a slow evolution within that kind of the market, yeah. the invisible hand, so to speak, at work, you know. So yeah. I think it's, it's kind of a market uh, is kind of moving things along, but it's not quite clear to me. Uh, where this is going to end up, other than maybe institutions at some point, but maybe not. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, I I agree. I agree. Um, regarding the the blockchains, right? I I've seen. Um, actually, I had a couple of guests. I have Harto, who is an artist uh, creating works on Bitcoin, Bitcoin ordinals, um, and he published on Ethereum previously. Um, and and he, you know, he he had a great point of view on, on Bitcoin ordinals. He has been there from the beginning, but at the same time, I also have seen the rise of Solana, and it's very mature. Like the technology is very mature as well, and there are artists doing well there. Um, in a way, um, I I agree. It's more like people are more open minded, right, to explore different chains. Um, and artists as well. And the only problem, which is, I mean, it's it's good and bad, is that there are so many places right now because in a blockchain there are multiple marketplaces and then there are multiple galleries. So I have, I've heard some collectors that are a little bit frustrated, right? Like, but I think it's they just have to learn that they cannot have, you know, a vision on everything that's happening. It's just too complicated. And I think our, th there are some collectors that want to know what's happening everywhere. And it's just it's just very, very complicated these days. But that's good because that gives artists a lot of options, right? And it means that our platforms, marketplaces that are innovating, right? In different in different aspects. So yeah, it's a, it's a 
it's a kind of a, in general, I think it's positive, positive situation. Um, and I'm starting to see um, what you mentioned, the, the, the maxis, less maxis in a way, right? That they, they, they are more open in general. So, so yeah, and, and what it's, maybe we can, we can talk a bit about your, your art in particular, Adrian, where are you planning to mint? Are you, mm. what are you minting these days? What are your favorite spots um, and, and things that are working for you, that the communities something you enjoy that there are good collectors what are those those places today uh that's a great question i mean tezos you really have to hand it the the model and you, you know and as you're just you know talking about all these different marketplaces uh the tezos is such a resilient ecosystem and like object in particular with their brilliant website i mean it really is like a futuristic social media site for me, whereas rather than yeah. again putting your lunch uh, on a you know social media site or looking at look at this fancy dinner I'm having, you're putting your art, right? You're, so it really becomes more about you. And so and but the functionality is very similar, analogous to your regular social media. You can follow people, you can like, you can buy. It's even more things you can do, even though it's more skeletal. So. Yeah. Uh, Tezos, I'm very excited about. I mean, Tezos is a wonderful place where you can basically, you know, I have something called a pixel art sketchbook. So I can make sketches. I can basically have fun, explore, try out different kinds of dithering, yeah. experiment. And if the work looks good, I have a place to put mm -hmm. it where it costs a few cents to mint it. And then there's this very resilient uh, collector base even in a softer market right now, who will still, you'll still sell work, you know, and yeah. especially if you price it at a nice price, you will sell out. So yeah. you may not make a fortune, but you still might make enough to pay for your groceries or a haircut. Yeah. And so Tezos mm -hmm. is still a, a very exciting kind of core place. I'm putting out a series on Solana right now. And what, what I enjoy doing with Solana, this is on exchange.art. What I enjoy about going mm -hmm. to new blockchains is, it forces me to think like, you know, maybe I've experimented with certain things and then I go, well, what would work? You know, I've done a ton of experiments. Of course, like I meant like 5% of what I work on probably, I, you know, I, sometimes just because I don't mm -hmm. feel like it's good enough to mint, right? And reasons like that. Uh, but also, you know, you just have a lot of experiments and then you start looking at your work and you go, what would work on this blockchain? What looks what what's exciting for this blockchain? What would fit nicely? So, uh, yeah. So I'm putting yeah. out a series now. It's kind of like based on photos that are super processed with effects and kind of retro pixels and all this sort of thing uh, on Solana, and it's doing really well, you know, and uh, is great, you know. So I'm really yeah. excited about that. My my heart, though, to finally uh, to finalize the question, though, is on Bitcoin. With, uh, mm -hmm. I still want to put because you can still mint a tiny file that can theoretically yeah. be uh, expanded uh, to infinitely to an infinite size if you do big pixel art. So putting out pixel art work on Bitcoin is kind of like the secret project, so to speak. Uh, projects I actually have a couple that I'm working on, uh, and just try and keep that file size as low as possible, which is a wonderful aesthetic if you can make something kind of persuasive as a work of art but still be like a kilobyte or two uh there's something wonderfully elegant and just kind of exciting about that and then you have work on bitcoin uh so that's just kind of which is just kind of exciting uh at least for now i, I mean as far as trends i'd yeah. say bitcoin is kind of the big big trend yeah. yeah no totally i'm i'm also a big fan of object.com i i I saw they recently released the curators curators feature, right? And also uh, a way for um, curators to earn uh, revenue if they if they you know share a work or they curate a work and it sells. So I think that's a very very interesting feature. Um, and there is just like the vibe around Tesos, as you said, it's a very resilient community and. and I always spend time there. It's, it's the place I go when I when I have free time, right? Just to right. go around. Me too. Works it's, and, and... it's easy. Hey, yeah. like I mean, you just load it up. It's you have easy. you see all your updates. It's it's brilliant. Uh, yeah. 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 
But at the same time, I'm very intrigued by Bitcoin ordinals, um, the, the, the same way you are. I didn't know about this, this concept of making the files very, very, very small and, and connecting them. That, that sounds interesting. Um, I, I just think that there is a big community building in Bitcoin ordinals, and we are starting to see you know, the results of probably a year, a year and a half of hardcore developers creating creating platforms and i think it's starting to see people starting to notice that and, and grasp the concept of um, inscriptions which is complicated but at the same time when when if you if you if you read it and and can put it in simple words maybe it's simpler than nfts you know it's hmm could be simpler to explain than NFTs. The thing is we are just used to to smart contracts and, and NFTs that making that change might be hard. Um, and Adrian, what about some artists? You 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 are somebody as we discussed that are looking at plenty of art in because of your show. Um, you had you have reviewed many, many pieces. What are some artists? Um, Adrian, that you think people should watch. Um, let's keep it at three. I know it's hard. I know it's a yeah. hard question. Who, who am I going to leave out? It's <laughs> the first thought in my head. Who, who am I going to forget? To, uh, yeah, it's an interesting. Like, and what is the question? Who are the like three that we should be that watching? That inspire for? you. That inspire yeah, me. Yeah, beautiful. Watching beautiful. Or that inspire you. Yeah. Yeah. Who inspires me right now? Um, like, I tend to be inspired by prolificness. And by putting out a consistent body of work regularly, I mean, I do always come back to I artist I really admire is Sabato is uh, just such a solid artist. There's always a conceptual kind of backdrop. Uh, it's really smart, just the rollout of his product. You know, Ux, I, I, how am I going to limit this to three people? But, you know, Uxine is, uh, you know, such a professional and how he has rolled out, like, I mean, the timing, I'm going to do it on this blockchain here. It's extraordinarily well thought out uh, from a market perspective. Mm -hmm. And the work itself is fun. And then there's tons that are going on, uh, you know, X, just like gifts that he just kind of throws out, making it look like, you know, just easy. You know, it's all easy. Uh, mm -hmm. Who else? Oh, and of course, his Drupal Waffle. Uh, I do love uh, who uses a lot of kids programs and it looks so effortless. Uh, and I love just like the fact that, you know, here we are all slaving away, trying to make our beautiful works. And for him, it looks like he can just kind of start scribbling a few things and in 10 minutes, and I'm sure it takes him longer. Who knows? Uh, but he has these beautiful, original, totally original style exciting there's pop culture references but it's not too obvious they still have this kind of big mm -hmm. narrative painting sort of feel to it uh so there's you yeah. know another one in a sense like a lot of us were already familiar with uxine maybe even sabato mm -hmm. too has dribble waffles slightly less known although i'd say within the community becoming a lot more well known yeah. um so yeah those are you know all uh prolific prolific yeah. pretty high quality smart the way they roll things out and for me as an artist that's important like because sometimes yeah. you can do everything right and then you don't roll things out properly and that matters you know like i have this peloponnesian war series it's like uh you know the rollout was catastrophic you know and, yeah. and you yeah. spend years on this stuff and then all of a sudden your rollouts doesn't work so yeah yeah it's uh, the marketing right like some artists are just natural at doing marketing and it's they are so good that it doesn't feel like they are selling that they are trying to sell it's more like a story that's right? exactly like a story exactly yeah. exactly you know where it's like where you time things properly where it's yeah. it's not marketing it's just smart and then you release some yeah. free stuff on x that's not viable you know or as dribble waffle just kind of sending stuff out uh, and you know, as Drupal Waffle doesn't even like almost makes a point of not making it about money to a certain degree. Uh, yeah, yeah. So as you say, yeah, 
getting the timing right, uh, it, it creates this sense of, because of course, everybody wants their work to sell for as much money as possible and have as many collectors as possible. So yeah. as you say, yeah. it's so brilliant to do this in a way that looks effortless. But anyway, sorry, yeah. continue. No, no, that's uh, that's fantastic. I think it's it's very important and, and many artists have a hard time understanding mm -hmm. how to do this, right? And how to share their work, how to price it. And these are great examples that they can look for, right? And understand a bit. So why is this working? What what is what is the logic behind this? How how can I integrate these mechanisms into my work? Right? That's some 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 ways how other artists can learn from these digital artists and from you too, because you are somebody that is doing something very, very different, right? Putting yourself out there, talking, sharing your ideas, um, having your show, which is amazing. And maybe there are other artists out there that could do something similar, right? And and I think we need more of that, more of that kind of content. And well, Adrian, it's it's been a pleasure. Um, thanks so much for for being on the show and. Hope to see you soon again. We'd love to catch up in the future. Well, thank you for inviting me, Kalo. This was a total delight, and I'm super thrilled to be on your show. And yeah, I think in a couple of weeks here, uh, we'll have you on the spaces, on their Twitter spaces yeah, that we do forward. here. So yeah, so we'll see you very soon. And that is exciting as well. And I think it'll just be a really exciting time where I can you know, ask you all about your <laughs> history and get a little deeper there. So thank you for the invite, uh, Kalo. And I'm totally delighted to be on, you know, this, you've built up something uh, really just credible, consistent, and like high quality. So I'm thrilled to be on the show. Thank you so much, Adrian. And let's stay in touch and looking forward for your spaces and all the best, man. Take care. All right. Thanks, Kalo. Take care.